not this is the point of annoyance. We tend to have people like straggling in here all the way up into 15 after so they can catch up as we go. Um, cool. So I, I, one of the things I want to cover today is um, so there are all these CNF white papers and now there's multiple ones in flight. Um, and Frederick and I had been talking a bunch like months leading up to this and now it's kind of fracturing because all the vendors are getting involved. I kind of want to talk about um, what the strategy is for um, kind of what the two main white papers are going to attempt to cover right now and where we might want to insert NSM um, since this is going to be a big, um, you know, piece of documentation and NSM making it into, you know, foundation published white papers. Um, we obviously want it to be in there in some type of prominent fashion as an alternative for cloud native networking models. Um, and additionally, um, I will share here in a second kind of like some of the content I'm putting together. I'm pretty sure it's going to go into the first white paper because um, it's kind of the whole journey thing. But then also, um, Watson, I'd like to kind of chat with you too because a lot of the CI work you've been doing, um, all of those of us in NSM community have been benefiting from. So kind of getting your take on where you think some of the content I'm putting together should go, um, where some of the CI, you know, documentation lemmas you're putting together should go, and then kind of how we fit NSM into either both papers or maybe super prominently into one of the papers. Let me see here. This guy, yeah. Go share for a second. Sharing is good. And so on my side, just a quick, uh, quick uh, remarks about this. I don't know if we need to specifically embed NSM and like in the core, I don't know, concepts, maybe in some uh, amendments to the white papers, I don't know, some, some, some form of, uh, I don't know, appendixes somewhere where we talk about examples and specific con concrete implementations. I think that is more important for us to um, more or less embed the concepts of what we are trying to do uh, within NSM into into these white papers. I mean, like to to try to avoid the uh, usual, um, I would say maybe the traditional mistakes that people have done before, and to to not have something that contradicts uh, NSM. If that makes sense. So I think it's going to depend on the white paper, Nikolai, because um, at least. And I'm not sure which one of them they're going to live in right now, um, but um, because we seem to kind of trying to be duplicating efforts at the moment, and I'm working with Dan on trying to get some separation because I'll probably end up helping with both, um, and I want to make sure that they both can kind of stand on their own. But um, at least in one of the white papers, like as we get into, um, like there's been requests from both Dan and our pit that like at least one of the white papers has like you know no BS like implementation information right and with the disclaimer that like all of this stuff is super early and we might decide that these implementations are completely wrong um to your point like just getting a white paper out on like what the cloud native concept should be for cnfs and things like that is absolutely pivotal but at some point like i know people like me and daniel we want to consume information that like literally there is a standard of tests that we work you know in the test bed on that like look at Danum, that look at Multis, that look at NSM, that look at different networking models and like talk about like what performance looks like, talk about what, um, you know, difficulty in operation. Like, I mean, at some point, um, I think that, you know, some real, real meat on like what it actually means to deploy some of this stuff is important. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to even go, but that's, exactly why I wanted to talk about um, us, you know, in the documentation group talking about like, where does NSM plug in? I, think, I know Frederick uh, has opinions on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it seems like uh, NSM has a strong uh, position for declarative APIs, which um, talking with people, it seems like, um, and, and a lot of this comes from 
you know, Ed and Fred. Um, it, some of the problems that are getting, trying to be solved by, you know, Multis or CNI, other CNI plugins, some of the other uh, ways of doing things. And then also with the VNFs, which are being brought in on some of the papers with the, the old way, you know, the journey and everything. Um, I think even if, if we don't say NSM directly, you, you're going to be saying it in, in you're going to be talking about NSM in a, in a different way, I like for all intents and purposes, because of the way that the declarative APIs uh, are positioned with NSM. It seems like it's a, a first order citizen kind of thing. Yeah, the the way that I would try to describe that would be uh, to describe things in with like cloud native principles, and uh, to be able to say we care about things like declarative APIs. State what you want, not how do you how do you get there, and uh, to be able and let the let the scheduler and infrastructure render that for you. So, you know, and so. If I, I'll give an, uh, an early example as well. So when I first met up with the, uh, when I first, I was at the first inaugural meeting of uh, the, t the um, uh, at the time they called it the multi-interface group and they renamed it to be the uh, uh, network plumbers group, I think, or something along those lines. And their initial thing was, okay, we need to be able to specify things like what VLAN and how, what interface and, and this needs to be kernel interface, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I, the, I had told them beforehand as well that like these type of things, instead of deciding them in that way, they need to describe what thing they actually, what the end result is that they want. Like I need a faster connection to my, to my data plane or to my, to my storage system with these quality of service metrics or, or service level objects. And so I think that um, we, we should try to aim towards, towards similar things and say, okay, we declaratively say what you want. And we've tried to design NSM along those, those principles. Uh, but I would also argue that if something else came along that should, that is trying to, or that is replicating uh, it, it, like a different project in this space. My, my argument would be that in order for them to be cloud native, they should also follow similar similar principles as well. Um, and so that's, so I, so I think starting with the principles is important. Yeah, and, 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 and I'll usually roll all that under loosely coupled, right? Because the declarative APIs, the reason we like declarative APIs is because they loosely couple you to the implementation, right? Um, the re and the reason that we don't want to do things like stick freaking IPs and VLANs into declarative APIs is because they then strongly couple you to things that are implementation details. Because you can write incredibly strongly coupled declarative APIs if you do it badly. Um, I've seen lots of people do that where you've got to enter every little IP address and every little VLAN tag and every little everything else. And those are, even though they're declarative APIs, they're every bit as overcoupled as anything else. So the really fundamental principle to me is loosely coupled. And that's the thing in network service mesh that I think we do super well, because the workloads may have an opinion about the thing that is most immediately before them, but they have no opinion about, for example, the tunneling types that go over the network, because that's not the workload's business. Why are you strongly coupling your particular CNF to a choice of tunnel that someone's going to want to make differently next year? So for the SP-led white paper, um, I think we're going to shift a little bit to less about, you know, some of the real like granular details on the plumbing. Um, well, I take that back. Like, I kind of look at this first one as like a book report with some um, technical meat to give people who don't know anything about cloud native and how it maps to NFE and what pitfalls to avoid. Um, that's kind of what I'm going to now try to shift this first white paper to and then work with the vendors on the second one um, to kind of talk about like, you know, what we're actually trying to do right now. But um, so unfortunately, because we have some crazy like, you know, rules, I'm rebuilding a bunch of images, but um, try to create like 
a bunch of things that like literally show step by step how something like, you know, this is the packet flow for vertio dash net. Like, um, and I've got like what all these numbers correlate to, right? Like packets received, um, packets put into the buffer, the, it's copied from the buffer to DMA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like the different IRQ calls that are called in between. And um, I've got like this for most of the majorly accepted like virtual networking things. I just need to convert all the images into something that's not gonna get me in trouble. Um, but the goal here then is to do that. And um, I've, I can't show you the other images now because I haven't cleaned them up, which is kind of frustrating for me. But um, I'd also like to get to the point where I'm gonna build like equivalent images for um, all the container networking stuff too, right? Like literally here is pod sitting on a host. Here is, you know, where things may be natted or where, you know, I'm avoiding that. This is what, you know, the Multis model looks like. This is what the Danon model looks like. This NSM model looks like show the different you know pass through the host in and out of it like because really that's what all of us care about in these communities is how do I get packets through that NIC have something done to a packet and then shove back out onto the network um, and that's kind of like I think I'm going to focus on unless um, people think that that should go into the other white paper um, but I just kind of see this first one as being an explanation of the technologies and like um, you know kind of like how people start to migrate, you know, and integrate what they currently have now in like the NFEI space to kind of taking on a more cloud native approach. And then um, other than, you know, just high level information and me building like some, you know, really granular data plane diagrams, I mean, we want anything else from an NSM context in this first, um, you know, service provider one. And I think, I'm getting a little resistance on just doing like the five principles because when I try to shop the other vendors or sorry, the other providers, they're like, you know, we don't, let's just skip the principles. We need to come up with requirements right now. And I was like, oh. well, then the vendors will just ignore us and say that the uh, industry's fractured and just do their own thing. Like we just need to come up with like some general statements of, you know, the CNI shouldn't like be the choke point where you try to lock me in, you know, like things like that. But um, I don't know thoughts um and it kind of watson in, in your purview like with this whole guide to things um would we put the limas in this first one which is kind of just talking about the journey or would do we put it into the next one which is going to try to just be like very granular this is where the industry is right now um <clears throat> the limits uh document i put together to describe uh cloud native the word the phrase and to try to and I know that the problem is like the vendors, everyone wants to, everyone wants to say that their implementation is cloud native. And then we use that phrase all the time. And it, you know, there's a spectrum of where it's buzz, it's a buzzword, buzz phrase. And there's just, there's the other side where it does have a definition. And um, that's really trying to tease out what it is that the, the users, so the service providers actually want the benefits from it and then come get the definitions from those benefits and then say, okay, if you do this, then you're cloud native. Then we can say things like, okay, is it, that, you know, one of them is microservices. It needs to be uh, something that's a, a developed based off of business capability. Um, for each service, not a bunch on within one one box or one container kind of thing, and we know that that's that's one problem with you know putting everything all in one big giant VM and then saying that it's cloud native, which by definition the lemmas say nope it's not. Um, so that's really where I would say it might not be something that you need to to bring in directly just saying it's something to pull from for the papers to say, okay, remember, we want this benefit and this is this definition. If we're saying cloud native networking, then here you go. We're yeah, so I, I just pasted in the link to the, the CNCF talks definition of cloud native, which is really good. Um, it is, however, several mm -hmm. paragraphs. And so I will often cherry pick out some things like immutable infrastructure, um, loose coupling, minimal toil, uh, as words to conjure with from that, right? Because if you tell me, oh, here's this Tosca template where you specify every little detail of everything, well, that's clearly not minimal toil. It's also not loose coupling. 
And if you're mucking about um, with, you know, screwing with things in the Kubernetes to do weird things, that's also not immutable infrastructure. So you're not in the least cloud native. Right. Yeah, like right. The, so my, I was trying to get a bunch of references as much as possible to get rid of any type of of. Um, yeah, I mean that, that's absolutely true, and that's a good way to approach it. Um, my suggestion would be pick out bullet points from the cloud native definition because you can then back those bullets with a cloud native definition that are useful mm -hmm. for being always stupid. Well. If you look at like what Watson's um, written as well too, right? Like this is just like a generic, which this is good. I'm literally probably just going to link directly to this um, and mm -hmm. copy and paste that in there and, you know, just reference it. But um, Watson's is way more, you know, just like, how do you actually like code to these bold principles here? Um, mm -hmm. Like the lemmas like are actually giving like developers like, concrete like data points on like it's one thing to say it's immutable but what does immutable mean because i can tell you i've talked to three different you know de's at um cisco ed who have completely different views on even what immutable means um oh i'm well aware and and, and so i think that, that the intermediate studies that watson is actually pushing out is super critical um the, the the reason i like the cloud data definition and pulling from it is it gives moral authority to the kinds of things that watson is doing does that make sense yeah. Yeah, the they, within the lemmas that I have, the cloud native definition, which I was pointing directly to how, what Dan was saying, the latest and greatest thing that he had on his on his talk, but it's this same verbiage, mm -hmm. the declarative APIs, immutable infrastructure and microservices. And then I'm making arguments for each one of those things. So immutable infrastructure, why and what both. So you have the benefits and from, grabbing from all the different authorities on the subject. So infrastructures, code books, uh, all the other different types of cloud native uh, awesome. descriptions and things like that. Declarative APIs, Kubernetes, as the Kubernetes literature has lots of arguments for declarative APIs, not outside of whether you're doing Kubernetes or not. So Well, and, that. and no, that, 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 that's good. The one point I wanted to make sure is clear about declarative APIs though, is it's sort of a, a, a subset of loose coupling. Because one of the things I've seen is the Kubernetes guys are really good at declarative APIs. They do them really nicely in a way that loose couples. Um, I can point you to examples over in some of the SP projects where they, they also have declarative APIs that are insanely strongly coupled um, because they've been done so poorly. Um, and so I, I think it's really, it, declarative APIs is a means to an end, but it's important to keep the end in mind. I'm gonna declaratively state my IP and tunnel type. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's an interesting thing. I had this debate and I was on mute and you guys didn't hear me. <laughs> but I was talking <laughs> with Denver about um, about Ed's position on Ed, your position on um, how you talk about when you say subnetting and you say IPs and mm -hmm. things being hard coded and all that. And I was kind of translating that into location. And then that's kind of saying um, how and not what, like you would say, we don't want to put IPs and subnetting and these types of things, it's too specific. You're saying right now, you're saying loose coupling. I'm saying that's closer to a not declarative, but imperative in the sense of how, like here's where there's a location, how you're going to set up this network instead of um, what it is you want from the network. And it's like a spectrum and I have my other Thing that I was teasing out the other paper. It's like there's a spectrum of declarative where there's Sarah at the very highest level. I want the corporate intranet. And there's the operators who are composing things and they're they're taking things from um, they're taking pieces from CNFs that were made that expose somewhat of a, a, a declarative API and they're composing them into a higher level one that Sarah can understand. So um, but the CNF makers they're obviously doing things imperatively, but they're exposing a declarative as, in as much as possible. Loosely coupled is a, um, you know, the best practice for all the way through on all these things. You should only be coupling those things that have similar rates of change and those types of things. But that's how I was looking. It's like a spectrum. It's how I was saying it. And, but my push, the pushback was like this both correct and useful. Um. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I've received pushback on how you 
um, you know, I agree with you, but I, um, saying it seems like people like subnetting and they like IPs right in the middle of everything, well, and they think that that's still the clarity. Vendors, vendors like it, I think. Yeah, vendors love it. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if I put my vendor hat on for a moment, oh, fuck yeah, because I will then sell you an incredible array of things to manage the complexity that I've not created, right? So it's, it's great if you're a vendor. I don't know how great it is if you're actually a, someone who's trying to get something done within your SP network. Yep. So I would simplify what I was saying, if I understand correctly, as like a position on saying location is not declarative. That, that's what it seems like to me. It seems like that's what your argument is and that taking that out as much in as much as you can out of your API, out of your descriptions, CI, everything, configuration, you will make it so that you can have, and then now you have all the arguments for why declarative helps where it's easier mm -hmm. for doing self healing systems and things. See, part of what you're going to end up having is like, it's similar to the European safety certification. You have like the CE self-certify for the general class, uh, except the difference is that when they self-certify, they take on liability. But in the cloud native, if you self-certify yourself as cloud native, either you don't take on the liability of your user's uh, complexity. And so uh, that's one of the risks that we have by uh, is basically cloud vendors or the rather these like cloud vendors with these vendors uh, basically self standing themselves as cloud native and uh, and end up over basically diluting the uh, the meaning just through sheer sheer numbers and so like that's where like things like the definition become very very important and pushing people towards declarative um, loose, loosely coupled environments is in order to manage that complexity uh, like that's and and in order to to get your system to to render your your infrastructure based upon your needs, then like we we need to push these type of ideas uh, forward because the the alternative is, ends up happening is as Ed mentioned you either end up with a vendor selling you something very large to manage all those complexities because of how they're coupled or you end up with somebody having to program all these things together or configure all these things together and manage things in a, in a highly coupled way. So. Yeah. I mean, and part of it also is like the, the need to replicate data in multiple places. If you have to go and specify IP and some of that information for your CNFs, but you also have to specify it for the infrastructure it runs in, now you've had to specify two things in two places, the same thing in two places that you have to manually keep in sync or go do painful things to keep in sync. I think we've run out of comments. Yeah, that's a good time the conversation is run down. My <laughs> internet keeps on me because, you know, we're super good at it here. Um, and uh, I keep losing audio. It amazed you how phenomenally gifted we are at both video and frickin' ISP. Um, so, so, yeah. What's comical is I, as I'm watching your screen and it's saying trying to connect. So we're, we're, getting, the, we're getting the outbound packets. You're just not getting the inbound. Yeah, it's driving me nuts. So anyways, um, I put this intro to the white paper um, and that's the one that like a lot of people, so this is the one that Watson, Taylor, Frederick, myself, Daniel, we were all working on. Um, I'm gonna continue to build out these guys, um, redo a lot of these images. And then I'm also gonna try to start making some of these very granular um, diagrams for some of the cloud native stuff. But like I said, it, it's mainly going to kind of be a book report for SPs on, um, you know, this is why NFE was really hard, and this is how we can start to, you know, incorporate cloud native principles. Um, and in my opinion, like, 
starting to use those even in the VNF space, right? Um, I mean, if you read once again, where was the talk definition? Um, containers says it right there, exemplify this approach. It doesn't say that you have to be containerized to be cloud native, right? Like if I've got VMs that are, you know, minimal toil, immutable and um, support, you know, declarative APIs to provision them, then I mean, I would argue that you could even have bare metal stuff that could quote unquote be um, potentially cloud native. So, um, you know, I'll kind of continue to figure out where like Thomas and Gearge and all those guys stand and work with Daniel on the Tug white paper. But for this one, um, this will kind of be like a for service providers, by service providers on kind of stuff to look out for. And for people who are completely new to this space, kind of like what, you know, from a networking person standpoint, because that's what they'll understand. What does a path of the packet actually look like going through this virtual infrastructure? And, um, you know, how does that map into like, because I think if they understand like how some of this stuff works and like getting stuff in and out, like, you know, imagine now instead of this being a generic um, VM, like in, you know, right here, this is like multiple pod namespaces, right? And what it means to actually put interfaces in these pod namespaces. And um, I think that things like network service mesh will make sense to them at least the networking people when they actually understand what the path of the packet means and what it takes to secure this traffic and ensure that, you know, just, you know, CCNA level basic network principles are being maintained even as we move into this space. Just as a heads up, I, I acquired um, a domain name or purchased a domain name, uh, cnf.dev. And one of the things that I intend to do with it is uh, to eventually see if I can get people to write about in the specific technologies that they're experts in. So we'll see about getting maybe someone like Ian to write about SROV, or we can find get someone like like Machek to write about like how do you how do you perform a good benchmark or so on, and just have like a wide range of topics that people can write about these individual technologies and. That way people can have a central place. Like what, is it, like, what does it mean to be SROV? And people can give like the high level definition, but it's, no, what does it really mean to be that? Like, what are, what are the details? So yeah. I, have a, I have a landing page for, because I, I don't think MSM is the appropriate place to store all of this type of low level details, even though we have to use them. Uh, and, and I think, but I think that we can, we can populate this, this other place as a landing, as a landing spot, because these details are, are important regardless as to like whether they're NSM or you decide to use Multis or something else. Like mm -hmm. these SROV still works like SROV regardless. Yeah, so. and I definitely won't have the same level of depth as Ian, but in this paper, like I have an entire section um, for SROV and it goes over like the VEP, the VEPA, like what a PF versus a VF is. Like it shows the individual data paths if I'm doing like VM to VM on the same host versus what it means to like, you know, bypass the kernel. It just, I have to completely re like redo everything and make it agnostic because I'm not allowed to do stuff and put it out there that I've already done in the past, which uh, that's a different discussion. But um, I, I basically have it for, um, you know, the first, just what is virtualization, right? Pair virtualization, full virtualization, type ones versus type twos. Um, Cause our pit asked us to start with like where VNFs are and then, It'll talk, um, I've got like some pretty granular diagrams on like what NUMA pinning actually means and like what, you know, it means to actually get, you know, your memory lanes in line with your PCI lanes and stuff. Um, and same thing like um, the VPP stuff and the OVS stuff, um, I've got some decent stuff on it, but you know, I kept it short and sweet for the internal paper. So I'll probably rely on the people in this group to like, we could go way deeper into virtual switches. Um, just because I think we'll see virtual switches pop up a lot in the cloud native space as well, just because as anybody who's seen in the Tug um, Slack channel, there's already tons and tons of arguments on whether or not we should just be like this pure, you know, purest user plane switching versus purest like, you know, well, maybe it's okay to go in with kernel interfaces sometimes, like everybody's got an opinion. So the, really the goal of this paper is to just lay out all of the information talk about things like, you know, like I've got a very like long section on what vhost user is, right? And then it would be nice to just like after that say, this is what MIMIF looks like. And this is how you leverage these technologies this is why you might use it here or there. And these are the pain points that you're going to encounter when you do use them. But anyways, um, you know, 
Frederick, Ed, and you know, chat with Nikolai and stuff. Let's kind of think on where NSM might fit into some of these papers, or if it's going to fit in there. You know, Nikolai is, seems way more of the opinion that it just needs to be like this very, you know, just kind of implementation agnostic approach. Um, I'll be honest, though, the vendors deciding that they're going to qualify what you know the guiding principle should be makes me nervous. Um, especially in the telco user group, but we can I mean, quite discuss that over beer. I think far more important than, than NSM or not NSM is we've got to get the mental shift from virtual switches, which are the wrong implement, to virtual wires, which are the right implement. Does that make sense? Because I, I think um, the, prime, the fundamental sin of network virtualization has been the obsession with v-switches, which tend to be strongly coupled enforce a common set of behavior across workloads that may or may not need them, which then radically increases the complexity of what goes into the v-switch, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think that's the really fundamental mental shift that's crucial. NSM just happens to be one way to get to v-wires. Yeah, well, this makes sense as well, because like, if it, I, I can sell you a v-switch, but I have a hard time selling you a v-wire. And so we, we have to help them do that. I would be careful with that too, because I don't necessarily think v-switches are the devil. I think people like having bad architecture and not employing v-switches where v-switches should be employed is what gets them in trouble. Um, well, but then they're not the right fundamental thing. And I'll sort of give you a very concrete example. The v-switch attitude towards CNI is why it is that everyone is fighting over who's going to own the CNI, because it's one shiny object to fight over. If you start with v-wires as your fundamentals, then you can say, look, I actually do have a need for a vSwitch, but it's something that should go into a CNF to do vSwitching. Because v -switch, the vSwitch is no longer the fundamental piece. It's a tool, like any other tool in the toolbox that you might use as a CNF. And you can pick the tool that works for you by using vWires to connect to it. Sure. But I mean, I don't know. This, I think we're getting a little bit into semantics because just because I shoved the V switch into a pod and call it a CNF, it still doesn't change the fact that there are going to be instances when I want something that's capable of switching for me running inside of a virtual or a container. And here's actually the, the really fundamental thing that it does change that's crucial is the way V switches traditionally have worked is you have one per, per server, right? And so they, they have a distinguished place that is welded to the underlying you know, effectively the underlying server infrastructure. By moving them to being CNFs, they no longer have a distinguished place. You can pick the one that serves you, and they're no longer welded to the physical, to the underlying server infrastructure, nor is the underlying server infrastructure welded to them. Sure. Like I said, I don't know, like in my OpenStack world, I, I do Linux bridges for slow path and I stick VPP in a container and I, I run it the way you're saying, even in like their traditional NFV sense. So like, I don't know, we just gotta be careful. Like, I don't wanna like say like concrete, like, you know, V switches are bad and we should do V wires, but then instantly turn around and say, but you can still put V switches in a container because now it's not, you know, directly dictating everything that happens in your physical infrastructure. Like, I, I think that the, you're, you're, you're actually making a very good point. It's not that V switches are bad. It's that, that V wires are the fundamental thing. V switches are tools. You kind of make, you kind of switch the V switch from being part of the infra as being part of like the, the PaaS layer that comes with the CNF, for example. Yes. So based on what you want to have as a framework, then the V switch implementation you would use would follow that kind of a path structure. So uh, you might end up with having a complete CNF with its own structure besides another complete CNF with its own path structure independent, and then you could have, you, you could move them around. I see the point. I think uh, having that kind of definition uh, accepted by the kind of the industry, I would say, is going to be, uh, it, it will take a bit of time because mm -hmm. nobody right now has, has understood that abstraction layer. No, let, let me ask you this, Ed. I, I think this is what you're really trying to circle around is that to form a connection, I shouldn't necessarily have the entire like, you know, point to point require a standalone subnet, a standalone layer two domain, and you know, all this other stuff that you typically have to do in a Vim slash hypervisor world, right? Like I can't make two VMs talk unless I fully define this subnet and I fully define all these ports mm -hmm. and I fully define all this other stuff. Like that's not the virtual switch's fault. That's the software's fault for saying that you have to have these 8 million things just to make two VMs have a point-to-point -point connection. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, but I, the, my, my underlying point, I think Daniel's right, it's going to take a while to shift the, 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 the mentality is the fact that you do have to do that is a side effect of thinking that the virtual switch is the fundamental thing. Right, so it's not, you're absolutely right about what you actually care about. But the reason you want, you find yourself in this situation is because traditionally a multi-point L2 domain was the fundamental primitive. Yeah, So cool. Um, cool. So I, I also jumped up, dropped an item on the agenda for this week around the website rework stuff. So we've actually had a PR pushed, uh, a very kind person at CNCF uh, pushed a PR for um, reworking the look and feel of the website. Um, if we have time, it would be good to take a look. Just I, I'd like to socialize it fairly broadly before we put it in. Yeah. Yep, cool. So, you know, this is the, the site. It's actually really quite impressive because not only did they do a good job of the look and feel, but there's a lot of, of new copy in here that shows that they really do understand what we're doing. And I, I apologize, like I have like the intro paragraph done. I haven't like worked on the example yet and I've just been overwhelmed. So I'll do some PR soon to get some of the stuff that we had worked on like a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. on the whole generic what is an SM thing, try to push it. But um, this is definitely way, way, way cleaner looking than it was in the past. Uh, it, it, it seemed really good to me. Um, but I wanted to make sure to do point people at it and, and have folks go take a look broadly and you know comment on the PR if they have any anything they wanted to comment on. But um, overall, I'm super pleased. Cool. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any comments on it or? It's way prettier. <laughs> yes, I agree. Cool. Okay, but I'll click through a bunch of the stuff, make sure all the. Yeah, I mean, I, I figured there will probably, unquestionably, there are always going to be nits, but we can always do follow up PRs for nits. Um, so. What's this failed? Cool. Cool. Anything else on the website, Ed, or do you want to dive into the technology tree? But that, that was it. I just wanted to make sure I rose that up to people's attention. Technology tree is great for now. So, I mean, the, the thing here, I think, is basically, this was my attempt, and I, I will admit that it's incomplete, right? So there are some things here that should probably be um, added that, that from specs and whatnot. But this is my attempt to try and figure out, okay, what is it, what is it that we have coming up that we're sort of specking through and working through? And... Yeah, so what are those things and where do we, um, which things depend on which so we can sort of put together the tree of what has to happen before what. Uh, so we can start working through it and in showing this to the NSM meeting, I think folks sort of thought this looked like the beginning of a roadmap. Um, but of course it is not actually a roadmap. So roadmaps sort of have more meat on the bone than this does. Um, and so the suggestion was that we refer it to the documentation uh, subgroup to see if you if we had opinions here in documentation about how to um, turn it into more of an actual roadmap. I think it's a, it's a good start. I'd like to see it as an, a roadmap because it's gonna make it clear how to all the interconnection points to see the the, the to get to that that the, that feature. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, for example, <laughs> the logic of the uh, hinter domain, which is dependent, which is uh, the next step, is hardware Nix and SROV. That's where uh, mm -hmm. to understand. It's really good to see 
I think I'll, I like it. I also like to see it as the interrelations of what like underlying feature gets to what, so that people understand the the relations between all the modules. <coughs> Pardon me. Agreed. Um, you know, and it also sort of explains things like I've occasionally had people come in and say, "Why aren't you working on hardware Nix right now?" And the answer is um, because we need to do other things first. <laughs> Like, <laughs> next. Kind of it, looks like a civilization game uh, technology tree. This is intentionally the case. Uh, so, <laughs> Gen Con gave a, a talk in which he used the civilization technology tree as an example at KubeCon. So, it was very, very much in my mind. So one thing I would suggest to Ed is um, you've already got some of these as links, um, but if there are things like say DNS here, right, which has dependencies um, on init containers and et cetera is in the text part too, um, as these, you know, all eventually turn into um, mm -hmm. URLs is to make sure that in, let's click on inner domain here, right? Um, I may have bored the link for inner domain. I need to go fix it. It's actually pointing to the integration test right now, but yeah, I need but to go regardless, yeah. like in here too, you know, you, if we're going to have this tree here, then in like the actual write-ups, there should be, you know, like talk about what it means to actually be dependent on security and init containers, and then talk about how it will also provide dependencies for floating inner domain, et cetera, right? Like, I mean, the picture gives you like a quick, like, okay, I can trace this. And, you know, once this is knocked mm -hmm. out, I get this, but I'm um, like, I would definitely have in the text and stuff. And like, you know, is, like are some of these linking to specs? Most of them should be linking to specs. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So like, you know, part of that spec should talk about what dependencies are um, and mm -hmm. what dependencies it may provide. Okay. No, that's a good point. In, in, in many cases it does like the draft spec points for Nix points to inner domain. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so you're absolutely right. I, I'm pretty sure we'll find places that that has been done less than perfectly. Um, you know, but I also don't, I don't expect people to have gone and read all the specs to chase back the dependencies. That's why I wanted to do a quick visual representation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think because people are probably only going to click on the ones that interest them, having like, you know, the caveats of, did you consider this? Um, that way people, you know, once these specs actually are completed and someone goes in and like just tries to grab like a single component without getting everything it needs, you know, it'll save you a lot of those, you know, weird emails that we get to the mailer asking like, why couldn't I do this? Like, well, did you do this first? So when talking about a, a roadmap, it's kind of hard to, to do that without <clears throat> having the priorities on what we say um, people are working on what the driver is. And I know as far as the test bed is concerned, we have some priorities where we want to move things from what we're calling out of band to in band and use NSM to do that. So making things more in a cloud native way, if you will. And I think the VPP cross connect is one of the things that we're, and Nikolai can probably speak about it, but it's one of the things that we have. And so when we do our roadmaps, we're tying them to issues and trying to make everything to where, you know, we're, we have all our planning meetings and stuff so we can try to pull some of that stuff and have a trail here mm -hmm. for maybe that block, maybe the re remote mechanisms as well. Yeah, but that's actually a, a really good point. And, and the thing is, you know, Obviously, priority is always super tricky in an open source community because you got a bunch of different people can collaborate together who have different priorities, right? And the beautiful thing about open source is you can have different priorities, right? Someone can say, you know, SRV6 is the most important thing, and we can all say, that's great, have fun, uh, without it actually causing problems. And then, um, you know, but even within that, communities are often very responsive to people saying, hey, this really matters to me. 
Um, and so saying, look, you know, for the thing that we want to do over here, we really need this is also super valuable. Yeah, so as far as the roadmap, <clears throat> I think those two definitely are being worked on so we can say that they're sooner rather than later, maybe. Um, the VPP cross connect and remote mechanisms, and then we can have some links to some tickets that we have open in the road. So, one thing on a roadmap, too, though, right, is um, we're still kind of also ironing out what the release schedule looks like. And um, obviously, that will have a huge impact on what a roadmap is, assuming that you actually are going to put rough timelines on roadmaps, right? Like, if um, there's only going to be like an annual release, which is, that's probably not what we're going to go with. Obviously, um, that might mean that like there's just going to be a certain number of features that all come at once, and then you know nothing else until 2021. Like versus mm -hmm. if it's a quarter release, like because you know to Ed's point, a lot of this is um, who's going to actually take the time to code it, and will it make it into release? You know, whatever dot x. Yeah, and I, I think, quite frankly, like there, there, there was some discussion of release cadence that happened in the network service mesh meeting yesterday. I think mm -hmm. there was definitely some sentiment towards quarterly releases. Oh yeah, I've been reading a lot about this recently. It still says vhost in it, which makes me nervous, but um, uh, pretty cool. that, that, it makes the people who've actually had to implement the damn th implement vhost before even more nervous. Um, yeah. It was a cleaner though than current SRV in my personal opinion. That's it. That's why I, I talked about this is that uh, if we're going to work on those things rather than try to backport SROV, I, I try and make people accelerate that part if you're not able to do MIS. <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is actually good because moving in this direction makes me super happy too because I really just want. What I really want from my NICs is I want them to lit the stuff that I want into RX into uh, you know into T, into RX queues in memory inside device inside you know CNFs and then I want them to blit things out from TX queues and then put whatever in cap it was I asked on it. So far, looking at this though, the good news is that architecturally this fits beautifully in what we're doing. So it's mostly just a tiny amount of different work. I don't think it actually changes the underlying architecture of what we're doing. So one of the things that I've been excited around this space too is um, Intel is working to uh, standardize these drivers. And when I talk to a lot of different like FPGA and SmartNIC vendors and stuff, um, a lot of them who, you know, aren't like just in direct competition with Intel are um, adopting some of these drivers, which means I won't have nearly as a hard time, right? Like, you know, Mellanox versus Netronome versus Intel, um, trying to get different VNFs driver, you know, vendors to support it. Like at least I'll have a wider range of vendors with supported hardware next that won't necessarily make the driver support model make me want to jump off a bridge. <laughs> That's it. Same problem. All right. Well, anything else on the um, technology tree, wherever I put it? I think, I think it's I'm good. Good, off to a good start for sure, Ed. And um, I will like maybe maybe this weekend, to be honest. Like, I've just when everyone takes a nap, I'll go down and write the whole, f try to finish the what is an SM, and then do a PR to the new website. Where I don't know where that went either, but. Yeah, so I mean, and hopefully, I want to sort of like give a little bit of time to socialize this probably till the next NSM meeting next week before we merge the new site is likely. Um, and then we can, you, you can definitely pull a PR against the new site. I'm super excited about the new site. I wouldn't agonize too much too on like the, you know, does this website define us as a community just because it's still just code and people can still make PRs if uh, tweaks need to happen. It is infinitely more usable, though, than the current one. I will say that. All right, cool. Well, does anybody else? Um, I don't think there was anything else on the agenda. Um, does anybody else have anything they want to add? Not for me. All right, cool. Well, like you said, um, you know, Ed, chat with Frederick, Nikolai, um, get back to Daniel and I kind of on like what your thoughts are and like, 
how much or how little or which white paper we might want to see NSM pop in and um, what type of presence we wanted to have in said white papers. All right. Talk to you later, friends. Talk to you later. Bye. Take care.